An example that I'm going to talk to you about is chikungunya virus, which you're very familiar with, and also Zika. And what's unique about this cycle is that for several of these viruses, including chikungunya, Zika, uh, and dengue, uh, this cycle is now completely independent of the ancestral enzoic cycle. Uh, monkeys are no longer involved. There's no longer circulation in forests, except in the case, for example, of yellow fever, which spilled back into the mental life cycle here in the Americas hundreds of years ago. But uh, I'm not going to say much about Venezuela and equine syphilis, but I can't come to Colombia and, not, and say nothing about it because this is really the virus I started working on about 40 years ago. And what brought me to Colombia for the first time in 1982. And at that time, we were trying to understand the origin of this epizootic cycle here that involves amplification by horses and transmission by Aedes and Serophora mosquitoes and leads to large amounts of spillover in agricultural communities here. And what we really uh, focused on here in Colombia was studying the enzootic cycle uh, which occurs, for example, in the middle of Montalena Valley and many other parts of Colombia. And that's where I principally worked for about 15 years. Understand this cycle. And then we used uh, a lot of reverse genetic studies and experimental infections of mosquitoes and equids to learn that uh, these enzoic strains, we call them subtype 1D, that are found in Venezuela and Colombia, have the ability through QS1 <coughs> amino acid substitution in the envelope glycoprotein number two to uh, uh, adapt for higher viridia levels and higher virulence in equids. These strains generally are not very virulent in equids. And sometimes also a more efficient infection of these kinds of mosquitoes. And this leads periodically to major outbreaks that can involve hundreds of thousands of people. The last major outbreak was in 1995 in Venezuela and Colombia. So we've now gone 28 years without a major outbreak. And, and this is a mystery to me. I, I don't completely understand uh, why before 1995, there were much more frequent outbreaks. And it seems like it, this process has not been happening recently. It could be related to higher rates of equine vaccination. But I find it very hard to believe that would be the case in Venezuela, where veterinary public health has basically disappeared, as far as I've been told by Venezuelan friends. Uh, and even in Colombia, um, some of you have mentioned that you don't think that coverage for horses the vaccination is very high. So I'd certainly be interested in your ideas about why we haven't seen this in 28 years here in Colombia. But I want to focus uh, this afternoon on three viruses that originated uh, in Africa, primarily two of these, chikungunya and Zika virus. And I'm going to begin by summarizing a large amount of data that was generated in a collaboration between my team and the Institute Pasteur in Dakar, Senegal, where they've been uh, studying viral viruses in an enzoic area since 1970 each year. They collect hundreds of thousands of mosquitoes and monitor what viruses are circulating. And so between their very early work and some projects that were funded by the NIH, we learned that for all three of these viruses, as well as dengue, dengue two occurs in the same cycle, although it didn't originate in Africa, we think it originated in Asia and arrived in Africa through the Asian movement. But what we learned was that several different mosquitoes are important vectors in the enzoic cycle here. Um, and several different non-human primates serve as amplification hosts. Possibly other animals do as well, but there's only really strong evidence for these primates. Uh, amplifications occur only periodically in this part of Senegal, anywhere from three to eight year intervals, and they don't occur synchronously. So if you can have a dengue amplification this year, but no chikungunya, and two years later, you can have chikungunya and nothing else. And after that, a year later, you might have Zika. So it's not consistent with these amplifications being driven by uh, weather patterns and mosquito populations. It's almost certainly being driven by herd immunity in these monkey populations. One of these particular uh, vectors, Let's see 
significant for the Called Hades Persifer, we, we learned, uh, leaves sparse habitats and flies into nearby villages. So it's probably the most important spillover vector. Uh, but then the question is, how do these viruses make their way from these ancestral cycles into urban habitats? Uh, is there some kind of adaptation needed? Um, where does human amplification begin? And we obtain no evidence that it occurs anywhere near these forests, because in fact, the form of Aedes aegypti that occurs in this part of Senegal is a zoophilic form called Aedes aegypti formosus that doesn't focus on biting people. So it's not a very good vector like Aedes aegypti aegypti for transmissivity here in the and that evolved in Africa, but spread around the world hundreds of years ago. Once the virus does reach a, an urban outbreak uh, uh, location, then uh, Aedes aegypti, by far the most important, but sometimes Aedes albopictus or other Stegomyia subgenus mosquitoes uh, transmit from human to mosquito to human. Uh, hundreds of years ago, these viruses were transported around the world on sailing ships, for example, from Africa to Asia for chicken gang outbreaks that were documented in uh, Indonesia. Nowadays, of course, they can travel much more quickly on airplanes. It can be halfway around the world in a day or less. And we've seen the uh, consequences of that with the recent outbreak of chicken gang that spread very rapidly from Asia to the Americas and then an explosive outbreak is soon all over the region. So just a very brief introduction, because I'm sure that you all know probably more about chikungunya than I do, having experienced uh, friends and relatives with this disease. It's, it's different than most arboviruses in that most infections are apparent. It's not like dengue where there are lots of asymptomatic or very mild infections. Most people that are infected by chikungunya virus get pretty severe illness. Uh, especially uh, very severe joint pains that can be chronic and very debilitating. Fatalities are not common. Uh, generally, they occur about one, one tenth of a percent of people infected and they can be elderly or when babies are infected during childbirth, when the mother is pyrenic, and they're probably just infected through direct contact during the passage through the birth canal. Uh, but the disability can be really staggering. Uh, some of the most explosive outbreaks occurred in India, where literally two thirds of the disability from any uh, health problems, including cancer, other chronic non infectious disease, two thirds of it during these outbreaks came from chicken and it literally overwhelmed the public health systems in many of these countries. So, starting back in uh, 1999. We began sequencing chicken living virus strains in the reference center collection and trying to reconstruct the history of evolution of the virus and spread. And so we already knew uh, back in that time that the virus originated in these African enzootic transmission cycles here. And at that time, there was known to be uh, three lineages, one enzootic lineage in West Africa, Another enzootic lineage in East, Central, South Africa, shown in blue here. And then a lineage that we call the Asian lineage, shown by these orange circles, that we estimated had spread from Africa to Asia probably close to 100 years earlier. Uh, then the situation really started to change in 2005 when a, a coastal Kenyan outbreak uh, spread into islands in the Indian Ocean independently from Kenya into South Asia and then Southeast Asia. We had millions of cases occurring in these areas and tens of thousands of diagnosed travelers, especially returning from places like La Réunion, a French territory to Europe, uh, from India, initiating small outbreaks in Italy and Southern France, and also to the Americas. We had uh, thousands of people arriving in what we consider to be conducive places for local transmission because they're dengue endemic areas. But we were surprised that this Indian Ocean lineage strain uh, never started an outbreak. But in 2013, the inevitable finally happened. And this old Asian strain was introduced into the Caribbean first. And then soon after that, one of the African strains was imported directly into Brazil. So we now have two different strains circulating in the Americas here in Colombia. 
you've mainly experienced this Asian strain. In Brazil, uh, except uh, early in the outbreak, they mainly have this ECSA strain, which tends to be a little bit more varied. So maybe a, a little bit of good news here in Colombia. We were gonna pick one of these two strains to have you pick the right one. But um, I'm gonna show you a phylogenetic tree here um, that was drawn at the beginning of these uh, outbreaks in about 2005. And what you can see is uh, what I mentioned before, that at the time we knew that there were uh, two major enzootic lineages, ECSA and West Africa. Uh, the Asian lineage was derived a long time ago from the ECSA lineage. And then these recent outbreak strains, the Indian Ocean lineage, evolved very recently from an ECSA enzootic ancestor somewhere in Africa that started an outbreak in coastal Kenya. But what was especially interesting as more and more sequences were derived from different regions where the outbreak was spreading was initially there was an amino acid substitution in the E1 protein and alanine to a valine at position 226 discovered in Réunion Island. And the, the French scientists that first sequenced the virus noted something very interesting, that this is a, a position of the E1 protein that's known to affect infection of mosquito cells from work on other alpha viruses. And La Réunion is an unusual place for the mosquito fauna because Aedes aegypti is present, but not very common. A different mosquito, Aedes albopictus, is far more common, and they suspect it was the main vector here. So could this mutation somehow be responsible for the first time really in history that there was evidence that Aedes albopictus was an important vector? And then the same mutation occurred convergently in several other locations and times. And each one of these places where it was detected were, were places where these autopictus appeared to be the, the primary vector in human transmission. So uh, the question here, of course, was uh, could we determine the effect of that particular mutation? But another really interesting uh, phenomenon that came out of these studies is we had sequenced many dozens of these Asian strains. Remember, these are the strains that were introduced back at the time about 100 years ago. This is the native territory for Aedes albopictus. So if chicken venue was adapting to be transmitted by Aedes albopictus in a matter of months after this outbreak started, but why was there no evidence of that for decades in Asia? And in fact, this mutation, uh, when we sequenced as many strains as far in our collection, we couldn't find it in a single Asian strain. So that seemed like a conundrum to us that we really wanted to understand better. So now I'm going to show you uh, some methods that are used to generate most of the data I'm going to present for you today. And these are the same methods that I started to explain yesterday for our attempts to understand mutations in SARS coronavirus 2 responsible for the increased transmissibility of the new variants to signal one. I showed you results of two different mutations that we studied in the first six months of that outbreak. And uh, the way that we do these experiments is that if we can start with a cDNA clone of the virus, uh, we can rescue uh, wild type or ancestral virus, and then we can make the mutation in the clone and rescue the mutant virus. We can mix them together at roughly one-to-one -one ratios. And then we can do various kinds of experimental infections. We often infect mosquitoes using artificial blood meals. And then we often assay both the body to see if there's any infection, uh, the legs to see if there's a disseminated infection where the virus has escaped from the mica. And then we assay saliva to see if there's transmission potential. But we also do cell cultures, we do mice, do a variety of systems. And then uh, we take uh, the original mixture of virus and we do an RT-PCR amplification of the region, including that single mutation. And uh, then we take uh, the harvests of any of these systems, do the same RT-PCR, and we take the amplicons from all of these sequences and we either analyze them with Sanger sequencing or more recently we use digital droplet PCR. And that allows us to quantify the genetic ratio here versus here, for example, to see which virus has won the competition. 
and this is very quantitative. It has a, a, a main uh, uh, statistical approach, and that is the null hypothesis is that there's no difference in fitness between these two viruses. So there's no significant change in the ratio from here to here, here, or here. And that means this mutation has no effect on fitness. And then the big advantages of this is that each experiment, instead of using 10 different mice for each virus strain or 100 different mosquitoes, every uh, infection is internally controlled. So both viruses are replicating in exactly the same environment in this competition. And that means it's much more sensitive to small differences. Like I said yesterday, most of the coronavirus mutations, if we didn't use this competition, we couldn't obtain significant results for assessing their fitness. And you require much fewer experimental replicates, and that's especially important when using vertebrate animals, but also mosquitoes when you have to assay hundreds of samples. So I'm just going to review with you some of the work that we did over the years with these chicken living mutations. So this is the first mutation that I just mentioned in the uh, one protein. It first appeared very early in the outbreak. And uh, using these methods, uh, first, uh, a student at UTMB who was working with uh, Steve Hitz and myself uh, determined that this particular substitution had a huge fitness advantage for these level pictures, about a 40 fold increase in the ratio from the blood meal to the saliva. And in, in the world of evolutionary biology, this is just a staggering level of fitness increase for a single mutation. Um, Interestingly, it had only a very slight effect in Aedes aegypti, which is a very closely related mosquito. And in fact, that same mutation conferred a slight decrease in fitness. And this was all done in the backbone, the cDNA clone derived from this Indian Ocean lineage strain. And as, as we continued to monitor the progress of this outbreak, additional mutations occurred in places like India and Sri Lanka that we were interested in testing because they had a very similar pattern. Almost all of them had mutations that changed positively charged amino acids like lysine to either glutamic acids or glutamine residues. And we suspected that this was not just a coincidence. So we worked with all of these mutations in the Indian Ocean backbone, and we found not quite as striking as the initial uh, A226B, but very strong effects on fitness in allowing uh, the, these mutants to infect this particular mosquito more efficiently, and generally no effect uh, in Aedes aegypti at all. Uh, we also wanted to return to that question that I posed earlier, why did all of this happen in Asia decades ago, in the native territory of Aedes albopictus, uh, where there was certainly much more opportunity than a single year of spread uh, following this big outbreak here. And so we made a cDNA clone of an Asian strain, so a different genetic background, it differs by about 10% genetically. We put all the same mutations into the Asian strain, and we found little or no effect for any of them. Uh, one of them even had a slight decrease in fitness. So a major difference based on the genetic background of a chicken living strain. Only uh, major effects in the Indian Ocean, not in the Asian background. So this suggests that there was strong metastasis going on that was affecting these mutations. And once again, little or no effect um, in Aedes aegypti. So that was uh, quite interesting, but not the end of the story. We really wanted to understand the details of this metastasis. And I'll show you in a moment how we went about that. But, Overall, the effect that all of these mutations have uh, is on transmission based on human viremia, shown in the red curve here. So this is a typical chicken gunya viremia pattern. It lasts for three or four days. It's very high in magnitude. But when we measure the infectious dose for these two mosquitoes with a typical chicken gunya strain, usually you need about five and a half loads of virus to infect 50% of them. And that defines a window when infected people are infectious for these mosquitoes and can serve as amplification hosts. Before or after that time period, they're not very effective for amplification. But the effect of this mutation, for example, 226 valine, is to lower that threshold by almost uh, 100 fold. 
And that expands this window by a factor of almost two. And so when you double the period when people are uh, infectious for mosquitoes are capable of amplification, this has an exponential effect on transmission efficiency and spread of the epidemic. So uh, I want to talk about a couple of other evolutionary principles. So I showed you some examples that I think are what most people focus on for virus evolution, which is adaptive or Darwinian evolution. Mutations occur at random that have a positive effect on fitness and are selected from the population. But there are other kinds of effects, like founder effects, that we think are equally important. So founder effects are a form of genetic drift, where when a, a population of viruses or other organisms becomes very small, uh, the efficiency of selection becomes uh, very inefficient. And so more or less random sampling of mutations occurs when a new founder population, a small population is established from an ancestral population. And so these are population bottlenecks, for example, following introduction into a new location. And uh, they can result in fitness declines if by chance introduced mutations have fitness reductions or epistatic effects. And so uh, we've done a lot of work over the years to look at these population bottlenecks for oral viruses. And we found that, uh, especially during the mosquito infection, there are several major bottlenecks that reduce the virus population. The first one is when the mosquito ingests the virus, it has to infect the midgut here. And that's a very inefficient process, usually for chikungunya. No more than five or 10 virus particles initiate that infection in a very small number of epithelial cells. So that's a major bottleneck. Then the virus has to spread out of the media through the basal lamina into the hemocele or open body cavity. That's another major bottleneck. And then transmission usually involves a very small number of virus particles, on average, probably about 10 for a virus like chicken mania. So there are three successive bottlenecks the virus going from one human to the next based on mosquito transmission here. And furthermore, uh, when a virus spreads, for example, from uh, Africa to Asia or Asia to the Americas, we think that generally that occurs through a single point source introduction through a traveler. So this traveler was infected by a very small number of virus particles here. Um, they, they, uh, they arrive at their destination. If, if they happen to be at a place where there are lots of these aegypti and they're bitten, they can initiate the transmission cycle, but that involves another bottleneck. Uh, so the initiation of transmission in a new location can result in more or less randomly, uh, not selected in the Darwinian sense, but um, sampled from the virus population, appearing here, then with more bottlenecks, more random sampling, and eventually the population can pick up mutations that were very rare or not even present in the initial population and now are almost fixed in the population after the outbreak has begun. And some of these uh, by chance could be advantageous, but on average, most mutations are disadvantageous for any organism because most are not synonymous and most amino acid changes adversely affect the function of most proteins. So this is uh, why we think that population bottlenecks and counter effects may be very important for these viruses. And I'm going to show you one example of the first one we discovered for chicken guinea virus. So I had a postdoctoral fellow named Ruby Chen who was uh, doing a lot of phylogenetics and was very interested in the three prime untranslated region of the viral genome. For chikungunya and all alpha viruses, these three prime ETRs consist of a number of different repeated uh, uh, sequence elements. And that means that the length of the ETRs vary a lot among the alpha viruses, from only a little over 100 for Venezuela and some ways, to uh, up to 500 or 600 for some strains of chikungunya virus. And, um, the, the average uh, of the enzootic strains in Africa we were able to do phylogenetically what we thought it looked like. It had three different kinds of direct sequence repeats of different lengths here. But uh, reconstructing the history of introduction from Africa into Asia, 
uh, we deduced that two of these sequence repeats here were lost, probably due to a founder effect when the virus arrived in Asia. And this uh, sequence, which we recreated artificially, has very poor fitness in any strain of chicken dengue virus. Um, and then what happened after that, as the virus evolved in Asia, it compensated somewhat with a, a series of point mutations shown here in the pink area that partially restored fitness. And then eventually the duplication of two of these repeats plus those accumulated mutations. But even the current three prime UTR of Asian strains is still lower in fitness than the shorter ancestral uh, uh, UTR that's found in every African strain of chicken many of these sequence. And when we put both of these three prime UTRs into every CDNA clone we make for chicken many, which is about seven or eight clones now, every time this confers greater fitness than this. So we think that this, this founder effect when the virus was introduced into Asia many decades ago um, caused it to lose fitness and never to be able to completely regain the ancestral fitness. And we think this is a lot of the explanation of, of why the Asian strain that was introduced into the Americas appears to be a little bit less virulent than most chicken main strains. The rate of chronic arthralgia and the severity of arthralgia seems to be a little bit lower. So that we think this is a very important example of founder effects. The other uh, uh, example that I'm going to show you gets back to that question of uh, why we never saw the Asian strains adapting for transmission of these on the this despite the fact that it's native to Asia, not to Africa or the Americas. And, and so uh, another postdoctor fellow, Constantine Tetsarkin, did a large number of experiments where he took these two backbones of CDNAs and he made chimeric viruses between them to map the mutations that were having this effect on whether or not the 226 mutation had an impact on transmission by albuquerque or didn't have an impact on the Asian strains. And eventually, uh, working through this, he eventually arrived at a single amino acid substitution in the E1 protein at position 98, that uh, if you make this substitution in the Asian strain, uh, suddenly, the Asian strain responds just like any other strain to the 226 mutation, and it makes it much more fit for azole thickness. So the presence of this single residue, the threonine, which is the, the natural residue of all the strains, including here in Colombia, um, this threonine prevents the penetrance or the ability of that 226 mutation to, fun to function. And in fact, there's been very little evidence that AIDS albopictus is involved in transmission anywhere in the world, which is what these data predicted. We also found a second metastatic uh, in E2 in this case that is more or less uh, found in about half of African strains, but the, the residue that prevents the expression of uh, AIDS albopictus infection uh, by the strain that arrived in Brazil in 2014 just like the Asian strain, it has the wrong amino acids, so we predicted it would not be able to adapt efficiently for any zombopictus infection. So these are the critical findings that we were very lucky in that the Asian strains uh, for many decades never found a genetic solution to this, and the Brazilian strain that arrived more or less by chance came with the wrong amino acid for any zombopictus adaptation. Um, now, we, we wanted to go one step further with this and see if that prediction for these two strains in the Americas held up experiment. And so uh, what we did is we made two new cDNA clones, one from uh, a strain uh, from Brazil isolated in 2015, and another one provided by the HT Pasteur from a Caribbean strain from early 2014. And we use these, we put in uh, the 226 failing substitution in both of these, and we looked at the impact. So again, the hypothesis was that in either of these strains, there would be no major impact of this because of these metastatic constraints that we showed. And in fact, what we found was when we did the competition assays, we start with a one-to-one -one ratio, and then we sample a mosquito population, determine the mean, a ratio after infection and see if it's significantly different from one. And in fact, it was not significantly different from one 
uh, either in the Brazilian or the American Asian strain, although there's a suggestion that it may have had a slight fitness uh, effect in the Asian backbone. So anyway, we, we uh, I, I think it was somewhat gratifying to understand the epistasis in this particular example and then to confirm it experimentally and also in looking for sequences in all the American strains, we've never seen this mutation uh, occurring anywhere. So I want to uh, finish up mainly by talking about Zika virus. So I'm sure that you remember even better Zika than chikungunya here in Colombia. I don't really need to say much about it except to remind you that it's associated with two forms of severe disease, Guillain-Barre syndrome in all age groups and microcephaly or other uh, congenital defects that now uh, are termed in congenital Zika syndrome when uh, pregnant women become infected, especially during uh, early stages of pregnancy. So we also set out to study Zika evolution long before anybody had ever heard of it or cared of it, about it because we have the, the most diverse collection of strains in the reference center. And so we determined uh, long before the outbreaks that the virus originated in Africa, just like chikungunya. It had decades earlier spread uh, to Asia, was isolated, for example, during the 60s in Malaysia here. But nobody had ever uh, diagnosed more than a handful of human cases in Africa here. Then things started to change in 2017. There was an outbreak in Yap Island here and another one in Gabon here. It started to get a little bit of attention from the arbovirology community. Things really started to change when it spread into the South Pacific in 2013. And about 100,000 people in French Polynesia were infected. But uh, other than detecting Guillain-Barre syndrome at a low incidence during this outbreak, the French Polynesians never noticed microcephaly at all. Uh, and the reason is there were not enough cases for them to notice it above the usual background of microcephaly from toxoplasmosis and other kinds of causes. But then, of course, the story I'm sure you remember well in 2015, northeastern Brazil, the, uh, the OBGYN community noticed uh, a recognizable increase in microcephaly. Uh, some astute virologists in, uh, in Bahia State uh, decided to test for Zika virus, and they found that they were in the middle of a major outbreak that subsequently spread in the Colombia and all other parts of tropical Latin America, including transmission in Florida and Texas in the U.S. So uh, I think largely because of chikungunya, the first question a lot of us asked was, were we seeing the same thing that we had shown earlier for chikungunya? Had the virus adapted somehow for more efficient urban transmission? And the first uh, evidence of this came from some work done in China by a, a student named Yang Liu, who uh, you, you saw his name yesterday because he came to UTM as a postdoc and did a lot of our COVID work. But uh, he and others uh, working with uh, Gong Chen showed that there was a mutation uh, in the NS1 protein that made the virus slightly more efficiently infecting AIDS aegypti. And then uh, uh, additional mutations were found later on that uh, have, have also a modest effect on AIDS aegypti. These are not nearly as big as those chikungunya fitness uh, uh, effects that I showed you before. But they are significant. And, but the conundrum was um, if these mutations had occurred when the virus came to the Americas, um, why were we seeing in our experimental work, a lot of us were doing vector competence studies with lots of different Zika strains. And every group I know of was consistently finding that African strains were more infectious for AIDS aegypti than any of the strains from Asia or the recently arrived strains in the Americas. So this was a big conundrum that we wanted to answer. Um, but anyway, to try to understand all of this, we again, we again reverted to our, our uh, phylogenetic methods to try to understand mutations that occurred during the history of Zika virus evolution as it spread from Africa into Asia, into the South Pacific, into the Americas. And what we found actually, uh, other people who had done similar studies had not noticed, and that was that there was a set of four amino acid substitutions and four different proteins 
that occurred either early on when the virus arrived in Asia, possibly as founder effects, or during early circulation in Asia, represented by this part of the tree here. And then uh, the really startling thing was that when we looked at mutations in later uh, branches, more distal branches in the tree, we found that every one of those four mutations underwent an exact reversion as the virus continued to evolve in Asia and just before it spread to the South Pacific and the Americas. So this was very strong circumstantial evidence that these mutations were playing some kind of role in the outbreak. And probably these mutations had reduced fitness through founder effects, and these helped restore fitness that possibly allowed the virus to uh, enter into a more efficient urban cycle and spread to the Americas. Uh, so the hypothesis was that African strains, and we still think this may be true today, maybe ha have the highest fitness for epidemic transmission, but that these four mutations, uh, when the virus arrived in Asia, reduced the fitness quite a bit. This is a Cambodian strain that we worked with. This is a Senegalese strain. And then this is a Puerto Rican strain. And we hypothesized that the fitness was partially restored, reminiscent of what I showed you for chicken earlier when the virus reached the Americas. So we did uh, reverse genetics using these three virus strains. We made clones of those. And we first tested this first set of four mutations here in the African backbone. And then we tested these four in the Cambodian backbone. And just to show you some more examples of these kinds of data, I, I thought I'd time to show you everything. But the four initial mutations, when you put them together into the African backbone, they significantly reduce the ratio when you divide uh, the final ratio to the initial blood meal ratio here. So there's significant decline in fitness here when we test virus from the body, from the legs, or from the saliva. So these data agreed with the hypothesis that the virus had lost fitness when it reached Asia a long time ago. Uh, we looked at uh, individual mutations, these are the four different ones here in mosquito saliva. We found that uh, two of these, when we tested them individually, had a, an impact or a significantly reduced fitness. The other two, the fitness may have been reduced, but it was not quite significant for these two when we tested saliva. We also used two uh, models for human infection because the fitness could not just be related to mosquito infection, but human virus. And so two of the early kinds of target cells for Zika virus infection of humans are fibroblasts and keratinocytes. So we obtained primary cells, we worked with these, and we showed the same results. When we put those first four mutations and infected cell cultures, both of them reduced fitness for infection of these cells in vitro. Then when we put the four reversion mutations into the Cambodian strain, and again, we predicted these would restore fitness. And that's exactly what we saw when we tested bodies, legs, and saliva, uh, an increase of fitness compared to the Cambodian strain here. So just to summarize this work, the four initial mutations uh, reduce infection of the African strain uh, in Aedes aegypti, especially in saliva, which is, of course, the key population for transmission, as well as in human uh, target cells for producing viremia. And each of these four mutations has an effect on at least one of these systems when we tested them individually. And then for the reversions, three of the four uh, enhanced infection when we put them into the Cambodian strain, and at least uh, uh, one of these uh, transmission targets, mosquitoes or the vitro cell work. So um, I'm going to finish up by just briefly mentioning my RO virus because I got a lot of. Uh, Nice conversations yesterday after the talk about my R, and I know that you're very interested in what role it may be playing in Colombia. So I've been interested in my R for quite a while. Um, uh, just a brief review of my R. It's really uh, almost the same as an uh, American version of these African viruses that I mentioned. These are non human primates, so bad mosquitoes. They're different mosquitoes, they're not found in Africa, like in most Japanomas. Um, this circulates in the Amazon basin, probably originally the whole way north through Mexico. But uh, our understanding now is probably this circulation 
uh, is limited now to the Amazon basin and parts of Colombia. Maybe. Uh, there are spillover infections that have been detected for many decades where forest workers especially become infected uh, when they're doing things like uh, cutting down trees and uh, small spillover outbreaks like this have been documented, especially in Brazil and also in uh, Quito's Peru area. Uh, but we've seen no evidence of this, uh, this urban cycle. All of the infections documented have been associated with exposure to forests, except in Haiti, where there was recently uh, a diagnosed case of dual dengue uh, myaro infection in a child there. And, and uh, Haiti has no native populations of monkeys, so it's not clear what's going on there. But we've been interested in what's the risk of this happening with myaro leading to another new uh, pandemic type barbovirus. And so uh, a student uh, working with Bob Tesh did some initial studies on this um, based on our uh, collaborations with the NAMRI 6 group in Lima, Peru, um, where they regularly diagnose cases of myarovirus infection in the Amazon basin. And uh, so she obtained uh, all the samples that they had available that had been stored in a low temperature freezer after diagnosis um, with virus isolation. And she simply did black assays on these samples to, to measure the range of thyridia titers in these people. And the maximum titer she found was 10 to the 5.3. Now, it's not certain that she measured the, the peak titers in these people because they may have come in with symptoms of IR after they had already peaked in their viridia or before they had peaked in their viridia. But this probably gives us some idea. She tested about 30 samples of what the viridia range might be. And this is a little bit lower than chikungunya peak viridia, which is technically around 10 to 7 or so. But she also then, she took uh, these titers that she had measured, and she did uh, traditional vector competence studies where she provided Aedes aegypti from Iquitos with a range of blood meal titers and determined the threshold titer, the minimum titer to infect many mosquitoes, and the 50% infectious dose titer, which she found to be about 6.7 logs. So this is quite a bit higher than 5.3, and this may explain why we haven't seen urban myara yet. If the viridia titers are not high enough uh, to meet at least the threshold for infection of these aegypti, the virus just isn't going to have a high enough R sub not value to reproduce uh, efficiently. And she did similar studies with Aedes albopictus with similar results. Uh, and then I mentioned this Haiti uh, strain here. We've been trying to get our hands on this strain to see if there's anything different about it, but we haven't been able to get it from the group that made us isolated in Florida. But the other thing that we did was, so after chicken baby arrived in the Americas, um, there were explosive outbreaks. That they were spotting in different parts of Latin America. And nobody knows what herd immunity is comprehensively throughout the region. But at least in many regions, especially in Brazil and in some regions of Colombia, at least half of people became infected by chikungunya virus in the last seven years or so. So the question became, uh, chikungunya is also a close antigenic relative of IR virus. Um, would the, the presence of herd immunity for chikungunya virus affect the risk of myaro emergence. So we don't know if myaro could be one or two mutations away from becoming more efficient for urban transmission, just like I showed you for chikungunya and cellopictus, uh, or if it's never going to uh, develop enough viridia or become efficiently enough to infect an aegypti. But this could certainly impact that risk. And so we did some experiments here to look at cross protection. And the way that we did these, uh, we infected uh, A129 mice or C6, C57 black six mice uh, with, with uh, three kinds of viruses. So we either used uh, a chicken venue wild type strain. So this is a wild type strain from the Caribbean. It's basically the same strain that's been in the Americas all along. Or we used a couple of different chicken vinia vaccine strains that we had developed in our own program, and you'll learn more about these tomorrow. And then uh, we also used a Myara vaccine strain that we developed. We used Zcas at negative control. We wouldn't expect flame virus cross 
protection for the alpha virus. And we use TTA3 of that as well, and that going to the latest slide of 10 with strain. That's a more distant relative to chikungunya and myaro. And therefore, we, did, we didn't expect a lot of cross protection. And we basically did these studies and we, we looked at a couple of endpoints that I'm going to show you here. The first is uh, in this particular model, C57 Black 6, we inoculated the animal in the foot pad. And chikungunya and myaro virus both cause some swelling at the inoculation site. So we can measure this swelling with calipers, and it tends to be biphasic. There's a very early swelling that peaks about day two, and then a much greater swelling that peaks about day eight here. And the bottom line here is that to prevent swelling here, there were uh, only a couple of examples where it was completely prevented. Uh, one of them was the negative control where the, the mice were not infected at all or challenged at all. And the other was the Myaro vaccine strain that we developed that completely prevented swelling. But the next best at prevention of swelling was wild type chicken dinger virus infection and not quite as good as wild type for the vaccine strains of chicken dinger, which allowed more swelling to occur. And then when we looked at viremia levels here, we saw the same pattern in preventing viremia. Uh, the the um, Myaro vaccine strain worked the best wild type chicken vinia worked next best, and then the chicken vinia vaccines didn't work as well as wild type chicken vinia. So the, the take home message here is that with a lot of herd immunity from natural infection, there probably is a lot of protection, at, at least suppressing viremia enough in people who are exposed to myar virus, but that's reducing the risk of initiating this human amplification urban cycle. But if we see a chicken vineyard vaccine, which I think is going to happen very soon, probably in the next year, there's going to be one licensed uh, by a company called Almeida. If we see a chicken vineyard vaccine widely used in the Americas, it's probably not going to protect against viral as well as natural infection. So we may be at a, the best point possible right now for cross protection, but that may not last a lot longer, which is, you know, it's kind of ironic that a vaccine might do wonders for protecting against chicken vineyard, but increase the risk a little bit of the chicken virus. But there's probably also uh, going to be protection uh, in the other direction if we don't ever develop a myara vaccine or we would expect some cross protection for chicken vineyard. So infection with wild type produces the best cross reaction, prevents swelling, and it completely prevents viremia. Uh, the vaccines, more limited cross protection, and these results say there's overall roughly 50% herd immunity in many areas where myara virus sense a lot of this may reduce the risk, at least for a while, of emergence of that virus. But what we didn't do was look at long-term cross protection. This cross protection could very well wane after a few months or a few years. And uh, we, we're going to uh, plan to do some longer studies on this in the future. So just to wrap everything up, uh, I'll, I'll end up by using my cartoon here and summarizing the findings. So uh, first of all, whether or not there's an adaptive barrier to these viruses moving from enzoic to urban, we see no evidence of uh, that for chicken vineyard or Zika virus. We do see evidence of that for yellow fever in South America, where there have not been urban outbreaks in many decades, and in Asia, where there's never been an urban outbreak. And uh, we have nice evidence from a student uh, of mine working on this issue that a lot of this is due to cross-protective flaky virus immunity, principally by dengue, but also by Zika now. I'd be happy to talk to you more about that, but I don't have time for the presentation. In some cases, once the virus has entered this cycle, there can be founder effects that limit how efficient this cycle is. Uh, in the case of the Asian strains, for example, it also affects uh, fitness and virulence. There can be epistatic effects that are also due to founder effects, but also there can be major adaptive evolution like this Indian Ocean strain that is highly virulent and has caused tens of millions of cases, uh, especially in Asia and also in Europe. So, so it's, it's not as simple as one mode of evolution or the other. This mixture of these and it can produce a, a very complicated and unpredictable outcomes because remember founder effects are stochastic. We can't 
predict unless we've already worked with certain stations what effect they're going to have uh, when these counter effects occur. They have to be done experimentally until we have better predictive abilities available to us. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, just to finish up by mentioning a few of the key players. Um, this is uh, uh, a photo of our group taken recently during the visit of Bouillon. Bouillon made important contributions to many of the studies I've shown you today. He was literally a jack of all trades, uh, working in various projects in the lab, participating with various kinds of expertise, including in DSL-3. Um, Ruben Chen uh, did the work on the three prime untranslated region. Uh, this is Jessica Plant, who did the experimental work showing that the two strains in the Americas will not be uh, affected by this 226 80s elephant adaptive mutation. Uh, John Ying Liu, who did most of the Sika work that I showed you, we collaborated extensively with Pei Ong's group, uh, who also who did a lot of Zika work with us uh, during the uh, pandemic. And then these are all the individuals who have participated over the years in our field studies in Senegal with the Institute Pasteur, uh, especially led by Malu Fialo, shown right here. And uh, so I'm happy to take questions if we have time or certainly later on. Behavior. 
Uh, Hades is just that focuses almost exclusively on biting people. Hades albopictus will bite whatever animal is outside your house. Um, it also uh, is not endophilic, like Hades is just that. It doesn't tend to spend its whole life inside your house, biting your family over and over again. It spends more time outside where it has access to dogs and cats and birds. This dilutes its transmission efficiency. But I think that Hades and Jeff diet is always going to be a more efficient venture with only one exception. And that's where uh, Hades albopictus has much better vector properties, like the 226 and all those other mutations in the Indian Ocean strain. It takes about 100 to, to 200 fold less virus to infect Hades albopictus. And I think that compensates for the, the behavioral inferiority of any cell things compared to the That's a very simplified view. I think uh, the point you raise about the Wolaki and cell things a very interesting question that there's someone to work on. Another very important question. Yeah. I'll answer that by telling you mostly about some work that we've done in Brazil. So um, I have a postdoctoral fellow in Brazil. We've been working on new technology in the very northeastern part of the country. And uh, they've, they've done very good surveillance in Brazil. The chicken wing, they still do good surveillance. They offer testing um, through the federal uh, health system at no cost. Uh, unfortunately, they stopped testing for Zika, like I think everywhere else in the Americas, except for pregnant women. But what they've learned about chicken wing is um, when chicken wing uh, started arriving, it would uh, cause a, a major outbreak in one city. There would be another city. 100 kilometers away, where there'd be almost no chicken wing. And then, one or two years later, uh, after a period of quiet, chicken wing would return again, and it wouldn't infect the first city, but it would infect the, the second city. So, there's this very patchy level of herding between chicken wing and infection. And in Salvador, Brazil, where I also collaborated since the Zika outbreak, they've seen something very similar. They not only about uh, 10 to 20 percent herd immunity in Salvador, including in a cohort uh, that they've been studying local sclerosis for many decades and have used for coronavirus. Now. So it seems like chicken dairy has not circulated sufficiently in the Americas to see it, because in Salvador, 30 million per Zika is probably 50 percent higher than. From what I have read and talked to people in many parts of uh, Latin America, Zika herd immunity is very high, 50% roughly. So I think the herd immunity really suppressed Zika a lot for the past few years. And the other factor, of course, is you don't test for Zika, you call it dengue based on clinical science and symptoms. And so you don't know where Zika is, how many infections there are. There are enough infections to expect to see an acceptable of Zika. Because, um, just by way of example, in French Polynesia, they have 100,000 infections. And there was no statistical uh, observation of advanced microcephaly there. They only discovered microcephaly when Brazilian data were published, and they retrospectively looked, and they did see cancer infections. So the point is, you need a lot of cases. It's a, it's a rare event. You need a lot of cases to see in microcephaly. And other than microcephaly, uh, it's just like that. There's no way to distinguish them. And it's also serologically very difficult to distinguish two viruses. You know, so, so I think it's a combination of very high herd immunity, lack of surveillance, lack of diagnostics. Uh, 
Antibody, antibody uh, protection in the between uh, genotype the, of the chikungunya. Uh, the reason uh, because in an uh, outbreak in Brazil for chikungunya for two genotypes. Yeah, so we, we have in our vaccines, work, which I'll talk about tomorrow, <clears throat> we always do two kinds of experiments. We, we generate our vaccines from a single genotype or lineage. And it's usually either the Indian Ocean lineage or the American lineage. And, uh, and but we do, in our mouse studies, we do challenge with heterologous lineages, all three. And we also take serum from vaccinated animals and we do neutralization 
tests against all three lineages. There are small differences in, in the context of neutralization titers. They're usually two to four fold different when you pick a different lineage than the one the vaccine was derived from. So there are minor differences, but I, I would be very surprised if um, for many years, if not for an entire person's life, they're not protected against all chicken vineyard lineages. Um, and I, um, you know, the, the vaccines that are being tested in clinical trials, one of them comes from an African lineage. And it seems to, so far from what I hear, be protecting very well in people in South America where the, the two lineages circulating are the most distant from the African. So I, I think basically chikungunya, you can think of it as a single serotype and no major challenge to cross protection. We're counting on you to answer that question, but we're we tried to do this. So uh, right after the Panamanian outbreak in 2010, we applied for a grant from the NIH. We were funded for two years. <clears throat> it's a kind of grant called an R21. It's an exploratory grant. And our, our only goal was to find an animal model that responds differently to uh, Eastern equine encephalitis from North America, uh, past strains and most strains of moderate alcoholics that were never associated with human disease. And then with the Panamanian strain that for the first time the modern Yaga was associated with human disease. And we tried a lot of different rodent models. Um, we didn't try primates, but uh, there's just not enough money in these are small grants. But we simply couldn't find an animal model that responded differently. So uh, I think we'd really like to understand that difference. But um, until we can come up with an animal model or perhaps an in vitro system with organoids or something like that. It's gonna be very hard to do the genetics when we don't have a, uh, a phenotype to study. But I think that uh, hopefully the younger virologists like yourself will take on this challenge and make some progress. Hi. Hello, can you listen to me? Hi. Hola. Are you listening to me? Sí, te escuchamos. Sí. Ah, perfect. Oh, uh, Dr. Weaver, thanks for an amazing presentation. Uh, I have like uh, two questions and uh, unfortunately the, the the listening right now for the for the question that you already have answered is not really good <laughs> uh, for this in the streaming so maybe has been answered before so the first one uh, is right now i'm in buenos aires argentina and in this country right now they are facing an outbreak an outbreak of dengue and chikungunya that they have never faced before uh, do you think that this new out outbreak here uh, could lead us in the north of the South America or even in the north of the country that have a new uh, outbreak uh, of chikungunya virus? Or do you think that could be more related with Majaro? Could be uh, this the new emergence of uh, Majaro here? What do you think about that? Well, I doubt whether Mayaro is playing a major role in any of this. Um, My, Mayaro does infect a lot of people in certain parts of South America, but I've never seen herd immunity higher than 3%. Uh, the best, I think the best data come from Iquitos, Peru, where they've been doing uh, active surveillance for arboviruses since 1995. 
And uh, they've documented a lot of Mayaro cases, a lot of Venezuelan equine encephalitis, of course, dengue. And um, it's never been higher than 3%. And these people probably are contacting the virus on in forests on the outskirts of the city. Iquitos is a city of about half a million people right in the middle of the Amazon forest. So most people are exposed to sylvatic habitats. And, um, so I, I doubt whether there's any place in the Americas with sufficient herd immunity for it to be having a big impact on whether or not there's a chikungunya outbreak. I think what's, what's a really interesting question is um, whether there are some factors we don't understand that cause some kind of interference between different kinds of arboviruses because, um, for, for example, uh, in Salvador, Brazil, uh, Zika and chikungunya virus arrived within about two months of each other. Zika about two months before chikungunya. And um, Zika clearly had a big impact on dengue. As soon as Zika caused a big outbreak there, dengue almost disappeared for about two years. And this happened in many parts of Latin America. And that's easy to explain by some degree of cross protection, serologic cross protection. But, um, but chikungunya produced only a very small outbreak at the same time as Zika. They're different families of viruses. There shouldn't be cross protection. Um, a lot of people have speculated that there could be interference in mosquitoes, that if a mosquito is infected by one arbovirus, uh, because there's an innate immune response in the mosquito, it's mainly RNA interference um, that's it's sequence specific. So you wouldn't expect it to cross protect, but perhaps some activation of innate immunity does cross protect. Um, the problem with that hypothesis is that um, Infection rates, even in the middle of a huge epidemic, like probably here in your biggest dengue epidemics, no more than one, two, three percent of Aedes aegypti are infected in a city. Um, you never see very high infection rates with any arboviruses in any epidemics. And so what's the chance of one of those one, two or three percent being super infected by a second virus? It seems to me like it's very low, unless we're missing something where certain, certain mosquitoes are just more susceptible or more exposed to viruses and they are more likely to be doubly infected than if you just multiply the infection rate of each one. So there, I, there are a lot of interesting hypotheses for why uh, there may be interactions between outbreaks of different arboviruses. Um, I, I haven't seen any convincing evidence really to support any of these other than uh, something like the disappearance of dengue after Zika, where there was clearly cross protection, but then unfortunately followed later by enhancement uh, shown in some studies where uh, dengue and Zika can enhance infections after the antibody titers are decreased later on. But um, I suspect that the, these these major chicken vineyard outbreaks in the southern cone of South America are just in areas where herd immunity has remained low uh, since 2014, and the virus finally arrived at the right place at the right time, the right season, and uh, an outbreaks are occurring now. I'm sorry I didn't, didn't answer your question very well. I speculated a lot, but that's really all. <laughs> no, no, it was okay. perfect, it was part of it. Uh... Also, part of the of the question, doctor, was uh, last year here in Buenos Aires they didn't have any uh, chikungunya infection. Was the infection of by chikungunya virus was zero. Uh, for by the second month, they already have more than three hundred infections here in Buen just here in Buenos Aires. So right now they are really uh, concerned about that uh, because they passed from zero to more than 200 in less than two months. So my question is focused also in, could we expect higher rates of chikungunya virus that even here in Buenos Aires, they didn't have chikungunya and they have this new outbreak. They, are, they were not uh, used to have this uh, infection. Uh, so 
for us in Colombia and other countries that we are endemic for this infection, could we expect higher rates in, of this infection by this? this? I don't know, maybe thinking about the uh, transport or the uh, phylo uh, geography or things like that. No, I think absolutely. There are going to continue to be, I would say, medium-sized chikungunya outbreaks. Um, again, I, I want to rely on the data from Brazil, but um, the other thing that this study did in Brazil is they measured vector populations. The government does that systematically. They measure the indices of Aedes aegypti infestation. There was no correlation between when a chikungunya outbreak occurred in one city or another city in the same state of Seattle, the correlation was completely with herd immunity. So I think it, it, it doesn't mean it's not useful to look at Aedes aegypti populations in, in places that may be experiencing outbreaks to come, but I think herd immunity is probably the most important factor, but why the initial outbreak only hit city A and not city B, uh, I, Nobody uh, that I'm aware of in Brazil has an explanation for this because clearly the virus was infecting people that travel all the time throughout the state of Ceara in Brazil. There were clearly introductions everywhere, but in some places the virus gained a foothold and caused a big epidemic. And in other cities nearby, it, there were very few infections and it disappeared. So I think there's a lot of things we don't understand about all of this. Um, but certainly herd immunity is, is very important. And I, I suspect that um, in a more temperate climate, the same as where I live in Texas, um, there are occasional introductions um, that result in very small outbreaks that are not even detected. We had six cases in Texas of chikungunya and we haven't seen the virus since, but uh, the virus is constantly being reintroduced and next year there could be hundreds of cases. And, we can't predict that very well when herd immunity is, is low because the other factors that regulate this, we just don't understand very well. Okay, stop the, the, the questions. Sorry, mm -hmm. yeah, this is a little mm -hmm. bit far, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you.
But um, so I did my studies in South of Brazil and uh, Veterinary uh, uh, Center. That's what I uh, I started and I fell involved in Africa. I've been working with Africa for the past 25 years. I've worked with um, Zika pandemic. I've worked with uh, you know, COVID response at uh, Yale. I worked with Dr. Moses. I worked with a lot of other uh, I'm um, you know, a deputy editor for class in microbiology with the five rural. Um, so if you guys want to talk anything about that, you know, by me, you probably want to But if you want to talk about that too, I'll pay the video for you guys and we can talk all the time because that's my passion. That's what I've been working on a lot. And you know, I always say that I think I'm learning from Sam to research uh, in atherosclerosis. Um, the funny thing is that I didn't know that, but I just like I found out by you know Dr. Weaver uh talk yesterday. I always call this is like where Yale is a school of public health. Um, I always say that it looks like a prison. It's very neat, but it really now makes sense because it probably they feel that as a prison for the buyer because it wasn't built in the 60s. Like uh, Dr. So it's like it's a terrible building, but that's where we are and we work. New Haven is a nice um, so. So quickly overview of what I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna talk about lactose epithelosis and the vaccine. We're gonna talk about the impact of animal health and also public health, and also like the fact of like slum health and the relation to lactose. And then I'm gonna talk about the one health perspective, and then you know talk a little bit about the fact that lactose is required in the disease and all the critical gaps of knowledge that we have for lactose, and then who will we affect in humans. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the research that we do that I try to. So that we will get to the question. So, you know, lacto is a is a spirochete, is the same family as Treponema and Borrelia. So, uh, uh, so it's like a you know the you know it's been involved in the genus. Uh, you know, if you ask me four years ago, I think we have like maybe like sixty species. Right now, we actually have sixty nine species of lacto. Uh, you know, more tools to actually um, you know uh, culture them. It's a very passive bacteria. So, uh, they have improved a lot because of like the isolation of the bacteria. And then, uh, and also like working a lot of the environments, a lot of those bacteria are sacrificed, but it's still, there's like 41 species that are considered pathogenic, divided into one and two, which are potentially in probably these like humans uh, uh, or animals. So it's like this, again, very biased on my side, but like a good bacteria. Uh, and again, I'm gonna, I know that you guys. And stay here for a little bit longer and listen to me, but maybe by the end of the presentation, not only going to know a little bit more about that, but also be wondering why some of you are not working with these beautiful bacteria. So, uh, so, you know, that, that has this very uh, uh, morphological, easy to identify in a microscope. We have the hook, uh, just curiosity. I think they first saw that this fire, they saw the hook, it looks like an interrogation uh, question mark. So that's why the first species was called. Even until now, they still call it. Uh, it's a very like a multi bacteria as you can see here. Uh, you know, moves a lot and actually facilitates penetration. You can penetrate your skin. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, the environment is transmitted. It can survive uh, in the environment for weeks to months. And it has like this interesting cycle uh, uh, which brings to like back to like an environmental, but also like one health. So, you know, the rats are always the main culprit. You know, the bacteria can colonize kidneys. You know, eliminate the impurity, you know, contaminates the environment and then eventually uh, can contaminate animals. And, and humans actually are even in terminal groups. Um, so, so that, you know, the problem is that the colonization of the rats can be incorporated in other animals and also colonize and also you know, contaminate the environment. It's a very interesting cycle for the bacteria. So, uh, you know, in terms of like a neglected disease, I always like to point it out because. You know, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated situation because I have to prove sometimes that it is an infected disease, but every time that I do that, people ask, like, oh, how can you work with that if you can see money from the disease? But unfortunately, it is a, you know, an infected disease. You know, the problem is there's like limited information of the disease burden, uh, there's lack of adequate diagnostics, uh, key knowledge gaps regarding the natural history, no effective control measures, uh, safe vaccines are not available, and we talk about those two things, you know. Yesterday, for those that are still going to be with me here tomorrow. And you know, and it actually has a poverty promoting social uh, societal impacts. And if you guys don't believe me that it's an infected disease, but this is like a paper from the Lancet Infectious Disease that just came like last year. 
And you can see here that leptospirosis is actually the third disease in terms of like failing or like neglecting of the disease. But you can see here in orange or whatever color you want to call this, that you know the amount of money that they use they have for like a, a investment is very small. And you can see, like, you know, for example, like African trypanosomiasis, where the, the baby is very small, the, the amount of money that they have is huge. So, so that's one of the reasons that why it is uh, neglected disease. And just like to prove my point more, even if you put like the big three there. HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, which of course has a, in a huge daily impact. But you can see this is like a, a you know, uh, AG index, so it's like the amount of time that people have been looking for articles of disease. And you can see that this spinal vector has like a 6.5 daily, which is very you know, high impressive. You know, you can see that uh, the age impact, the age impact is very low compared to all of these things like dengue, you know, of course, syphilis. And then, uh, you know, the same thing when it comes to funding, as I mentioned before. So, you know, the daily high, but the number of funding very small. You know, we have more and more funding for trypanosomiasis, as you know, since the baby fever, we have lower daily. So, you know, very important to get like this. And, and, and then going back to this whole idea of like one health, but also the fact, you know, why, you know, I consider like an important disease as well is because of like the, you know, the role that I have had. Back to the final. So, you know, it is an endemic transmission in tropics. Uh, as we know, the largest disasters that are associated with outbreaks come from uh, 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 climatic, you know, uh, events. You know, Nicaragua in 95 and 2000, you know, typhoon in 95, and then you have like hurricanes and Philippines in 2009, and more recently 2017, Puerto Rico, where you have like a huge group of cases uh, after those events. You know, in a study in 2014, it showed that that's a year that the year to year variation uh, due to El uh, Nino, you know, what happened in the South and So, you know, it's extreme climatic events project increase the global warming. So, you can imagine, like, you know, global warming coming up, you know, the number of electric cases uh, is going to increase in the world that we have like more, you know, flooding, more hurricanes, and everything else. Uh, in terms of like animal health, it's unfortunately, you know, it's a very important zoonotic disease in the whole world. Uh, there's not a lot of good studies that, uh, that uh, to, to uh, summarize the impact of like, the in, in, in animals. I mean, this is like a last study that has like a very good uh, uh, overall uh, impact in the uh, Caribbean and South America. And you can see all those uh, countries, most of the countries in Caribbean and South America have outbreaks of leopard related to animals and confirm outbreaks. So it's like a, um, uh, it you know has a huge impact in terms of like acute and life threatening disease for any animals or dogs, but it then it has like a major economic impact when it comes to like livestock uh, animals, like cattle, pigs, uh, um, and can cause chronic disease and can cause like a you know reproductive uh, um, uh, issues and loss drop of production of milk and then you know that evolves like loss of money. For um, uh, for the farmers, you know, and even in a country like I'm sorry, in a continent like Africa, uh, uh, you can see there's that, you know all those white part, you know, there's no studies about lack. I mean, this is like a totality, even the situation didn't change much. But you can see the interesting point that like, when you have those dark countries, like Egypt, Egypt uh, 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 you know, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Madagascar, South Africa. You know, what they saw is like, which is very common in Latin, that you saw like two studies that you saw presence in the animal who also suppressed in, uh, in humans. So that's a very common situation for the tropical diseases and for neglected diseases as well. I mean, of course, some countries they only have studies in, uh, in animals, or some countries only have studies in, in humans, but it's very common to have those two things happening at the same time. And so, you know, we can imagine that an effective vaccine that you would have for the world would have a major impact in the whole health. Uh, sorry, one health. Uh, and this is just like a hint for you because again, I'm going to talk more about vaccines uh, uh, tomorrow. But then, so of course, the, the public health impact of lactose uh, uh, is uh, it's also major. So traditionally, it was like a rural disease uh, happening for people like literally being killed in animals or being, you know, in the, uh, uh, with either wild or, or livestock. Uh, but it becomes a globalization uh, and also patient, right? So it's like veterinary working in uh, in uh, slaughterhouses, uh, very famous cases of infectious disease sewers uh, in Paris. Uh, but with globalization, so it becomes like it's a burden disease that you have like more and more outbreaks happening throughout the world. So like I said, I mean some famous ones like the, this uh, uh, 
triathlon in Lake Springfield, Illinois, in that state in 98. So people are contaminated with triathlon. A lot of people got contaminated with the before that. There's a runoff the night before, you know, a lot of animals in the area, so contaminated the lake, people got infected, a lot of people got infected. Uh, traveling globalization, so there's like echo challenge in Cornell, very clean in town, a lot of people got infected as well. And then you have, like I mentioned before, extreme climatic events like Mumbai, Philippines, and also like a Puerto Rico. And then the major issues nowadays that we're facing is the inner city homeless population, uh, which, you know, again, complicated like a situation that, uh, you know, lack of sanitation, and lack of proper hygiene, and rats. And then rat urbanization and slum, which is like, you know, the same piece. It's, it is a life threatening disease, so the most common is wells, uh, called like a well syndrome, where you have like a you have like a acute failure of like kidneys and liver, and you have like a you know jaundice, and then you know patient becomes like completely like yellow or orangey. Uh, and then more recently, you've seen a lot of cases of pulmonary hemorrhagic syndrome, so people are doing little like breathing in their blood. And you know the fatality can, can go from like 20 to 50 percent. Pulmonary hemorrhagic syndrome has like almost like 50 percent of fatality uh, when you get to that point. Uh, in a study that you know was conducted by Yale, but also Brazil, they show you know it showed like there's like over a million cases uh, yearly in the globe, and more than sixty thousand people are dying. I mean, this is probably like a you know underestimation because we talk a little bit more, but you know diagnostic is terrible, like the is and also being effective disease. Not a lot of people are doing. There's a lot of parts of the world that don't have any results or or uh, definition about uh, etiology or you know the effective. Uh, it is a living consider living on not cause of morbidity and mortality in the world. Uh, I this I always put it here, although I already like uh, shout it out that nobody knows so far why adult males have high risk. So I'm not gonna give you that answer. I don't know, there's a lot of people trying to understand why that happened, but it's a common trend that we see in several studies that does for epidemiology and lab And of course, it is in you know more common resource for you know regions. You can see here, you know, mostly affected. Traffic, and that's also where you have more studies being uh, uh, done. And this is just to show, like, you know, uh, 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 I usually try to put that in like more for American audience because we do think that we're the region not part of the United States. Is it like left wing, not in the United States? And so, like, well, as far as I know, Puerto Rico is part of the United States. So, you know, that happens there too. So, in 2017, Hurricane Maria hit, and you can see here exactly this is the number of you know, suspected cases, suspected death. Of uh, like the you can see right after the hurricane Mitch, you can see the number increase, and the same thing for the number of like uh, you know serology that was positive. And it's still in the United States, if you ask people, so like mm, I don't know if that's the left of you know, like things happen there, so they don't think that it's left uh, at all. So you know, so now I show this, you know, this data, and this is like a uh, in 2021, this is actually uh, they did like a, a, a for the New York City uh, Health and Mental Hygiene Department. So they released in October 2021, so I'll give you the final numbers. Uh, and they released a special uh, uh, report for doctors and professors in the city because actually what happened is like the average number of left cases in New York City is like, is like three to four per year for the past 15 years. In 2021, in October, September, October, when they did this, they, they already had 14. The end of the year ended with 17 cases of left cases. So there's like one death, uh, one people got like a girl's travel. All the other 16 people actually got like a girl's in the city. Okay? And the vast majority of them are risk of like that like girl's like contact with rats or like a you know puddle of water. And uh, and actually a lot of those people actually have were in extreme homes. So you know, just to just show you that it is a problem that's gonna happen. It's not only in New York, it's happening in Europe, major cities that people being more infected. In Europe as well. And then it become like a huge thing in New York Times. Like there's a lot of like news about it. I don't know if you guys follow, but it's literally just high in like what they call like the rat bizarre. Somebody getting like $150,000 per year just to rats, basically hunt rats in the city uh, to solve the issue of like uh, uh, leptospirosis. And not actually rats, it's major than leptospirosis in, in New York City. But of course, at the issue of life going that way, the bacteria thrives is this situation. This is our site study. Uh, uh, actually, you know, Dr. Lisa commented about it. That we've been working there since 2003. Uh, we do four work annually in the city, in this, you know, specifically in this area in Palma Lima. 
uh, now actually this study this area has become like also says for city guy and also now currently becoming like said as well OB as well. And you can see this is like an open sewer. I always like to point out that you, know, you see this mark there. This is where the water hits when it rains. This is like a valley. So you can imagine people going to work, people going to school, you cannot avoid getting this water, which is not only rainwater, it's also water that comes from the sewer, from animals, from runoffs. And, you know, and then sometimes people actually get to go inside, not surprised with the woman that actually go inside the sewer, cleaning the sewer because to avoid to sort of like get all the dirty so the water doesn't come out of the sewer and the canal and get into the house. So that's, of course, it's like the major issue of that the are, which is lung areas, which is like, this is south of Brazil, but you can see exactly the same things, you know, the scene in, in uh, uh, major countries and countries uh, south of Asia, like you know, Sri Lanka, Thailand, India, some places in China as well, and some places in Africa, you can see that situation. So, you know, it is a, a, a annual rainfall associated epidemics. And one of the few diseases that I know, at least, I think the only one that I can think about is cholera, where you can literally put the number of like how much rain in a city or in the state or in the country, and it can actually superpose the number of cases. You can see the blue is the rain, and then it majorly rain, you have more cases, rain, more cases, rain, more cases, and so far. So you can see that every single year we do see that same uh, disease. Uh, you can see here, this is like burrows for rats in the community. Uh, so it is uh, 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 domestic rats is the main uh, uh, reservoir in those places. The studies that have been done, actually almost like 80% of the rats, they have a growth in the kidneys. And we have a very specific situation in Salvador, which helped a lot in our studies, which is like we only have one sewer bar circulating. I mentioned to you guys before about 69 species or 20, 20, 41 species. There's over like 300 sewer bars among those 41 that can cause disease. In Salvador, is a, you know, it's good for our study because we only have one, but it can be bad for other situations. Since, you know, other places in the world are not so lucky, there's a huge diversity, you know, so, you know, Colombia is one of them. So, you know, and then of course that uh, we've been doing, as I mentioned before, uh, we have like 11,000 people that have been like recruited in this school since 2003. Uh, we have an infection rate of 4.3% per year. As I mentioned before, highest rate in adult males, uh, although women and children can also be exposed, uh, high risk for males who develop severe atherosclerosis. And then, as I mentioned to you, the valley, so there's a risk, actually, can count the risk to actually being uh, infected by the location and how close you are to the valley, uh, to the bottom of the valley. So, higher you are, less risk to have to get atherosclerosis, closer you are, higher risk to have. In our studies, being like, you know, we do like road and traffic, we do GIS surveys of slum environment, environmental centers, mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about a little bit more. And we've actually been doing in the past years uh, biannual surveys, or being like doing surveys six months. And the interesting thing is that when we do that, you know, it's so ridiculous the, 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 how like the virus spread in the environment and how many people actually got in contact with that virus. But if you know you're short on the period of time, you actually found more infections. So the more you you, you shorten the time you do your studies, you have more infections uh, that you find. The risk factors are the same, but you can see more and more infections because people are constantly being infected and then antibodies and human antibodies they drop quickly. And then you do it two, three months later, and then you just get a pick again because they got infected again. So, much, so, much. so, you know, just a little bit about like the, you know, story of leptospirosis in Colombia. This is just like a very small snapshot. There's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, good research being done in Africa. I just want to point out a couple of things. So it's, it is a mandatory not to file with disease since 2007. And then, you know, the study that shows in 2016, 2018, there's like, you know, 1,800 cases of the disease. And interesting things like almost 20% of those are, you know, happening in the market. There's a lot of cases happening, you know, here. Uh, and then a fixed catalog, a fixed catalog can be from 1.4 to 2.1 uh, uh, to this one. So, you know, it's interesting that I mentioned to you about the diversity. So this is a study that actually uh, uh, did a couple of years ago, showing that, you know, there's a first uh, evidence of epidurosis, leptospira sensa hosei, was isolated here, but they also isolated leptospira uh, uh, in the hoglins, which is the most common species, but also many areas. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, species circulating uh, in the country. And, uh, um, and this is more recent study uh, done by uh, Janet Perry Garcia that she shows is very interesting. They, they look at dogs infection and then they correlate the dog, which is like, you know, you see the colors here, the higher 
you know, darker color, more cases of uh, positivity for uh, uh, for humans, but then uh, the, the little circles in where the dogs are positive. And you can see there's a huge interaction between where you have dogs and where you have human cases. So just bringing back to this whole, you know, interesting technology of actually being like either like the, the dogs are helping to create more spillover in humans, or because they live in the same environment, environment that they have those two populations to be uh, independently uh, possible. And then more recently, uh, you know, there's a study that uh, uh, done by the couple of contacts in Peter Bellis and Carlos Bogos from the university from years of one spent a year with me uh, at Yale. And then he studied uh, rural areas of rural bodies and then identified you know, almost 30% of pseudo prevalence and almost 50% of incidence cases of epidemiologists in that population. And he showed like some interesting uh, risk factors for the disease, like for males, outdoor rotation, uh, uh, and then of course the presence of 34, so you know, very much into the environment part, you know, for women actually present the piglets. And you know, he did an interesting comparison between the hog, which is the most pathogenic. You know, species, but also others. And you know, there's some interesting differences in terms of like a risk. So for interhog, you can see other patients, you can see foreign culture and the presence of rats, which makes sense because we know that interhog is very in the rats. But for other species of lepidopterus, we saw like in you know, the cassava culture and hunting canines, you know, which I can go back to many uh, studies that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Van did uh, as well. So you know, going to uh, uh, a little bit about lepto, you know, lepidopterus, you know, pathogenesis. I do a lot of work. I, I forgot to mention that. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm not promiscuous about the bacteria that I work, but I am promiscuous about the kind of work that I do. So I'm very multidisciplinary. So I do like basic research, and very applied research. Uh, so I, you know, I do a lot of research in terms of pathogenesis and mechanism of infection. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to talk about much of those. I mean, I do. In hours, but I just want to you know tell you a little bit about what, what we know about the determinants of the disease. So as I mentioned before, it's highly mobile, so it can penetrate the tissues, uh, has a rapid dissemination in the host, and then it could it cause persistent immunocolonization in maintenance hosts. And this is like a you know like microscopy of a kidney or a rat. You can see like all those little things, those are all lactose that is stuck in the kidney and the tumor. So every time it feeds, it eliminates like cows and then even in the bacterial environment. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it causes inflammation and tissue damage in susceptible hosts. So this is like the model that we use, which is hamsters. And you can see uh, severe and a pulmonary hemorrhage. And I mean, it's very hard to see jaundice in hamsters. You can see more like guinea pigs, but you can see, uh, you know, inflammation in the liver. Uh, and then, you know, like fan left to fries and not a death for hamsters and hamsters, like less than damage. So there's a very limited understanding about uh, the, the mechanism of pathogenesis. So one of the things is that, you know, it's a very, as I mentioned before, that it's a skin infected girl, but it's also like very difficult to do genetic transformation. Uh, so the only, the first virulence factor actually uh, was done by our group in 2007, not so many years ago, that's the first published virulence factor for bacteria. So the bacteria, this is an idea, was first isolated in 1916 by a Chinese, Japanese group. And only the first demonstration of a molecular combination actually just happened, you know, a year, you know, after the first term in the in 2000. The situation didn't improve much uh, in, in that terms. And here, just like some of the, the main gap that we have in terms of pathogenesis and laughter, the fact that, as I mentioned before, we don't know a string specific factors that affect like the to pathogenesis. There's like 41 species, 300 sort of We have no idea how those things play a role in terms of pathogenesis. You know, route and infection can have an effect on that too. We don't know the contribution of individual genes or combination of genes to the overall virulence. As I mentioned before, I think 2007, first virulence factor, if I count it now, I think we have seven, okay, 4,500 true genes in the food and lab. There's seven published virulence factors for that. You know, uh, you know, I think our group probably has five of those. So, um, Relationship between dose of infection and outcome. So we don't know in terms of like acute chronic infection, you know, if there's any impact of the dose and the, and the infection itself. But you know, we know, for example, dogs can have be completely asymptomatic and not have the virus in their kidney. But we also know that dogs can die from feeding from the dose from the same strain. So, so that we don't know if it's a dose, you know, or multiple infections they have in the past. We don't know. 
when you understand that the poor immune response and reduce collapse growth infection, either by the host of the reservoir, and again, for asymptomatic persistent disease. And then you have the understanding how it describes the baby immune system, which potentially could help us understand also why they stay in the case and why they do shedding. Uh, you know, global health impact of cirrhosis, diversity, and animal health. And this is a one health approach in the environment. We're going to talk more about that. And the better understanding of the molecular mechanism of cirrhosis dissemination. Uh, in vitro surrogate, and we're going to talk about some of the research that we're doing in there. But basically, so the molecular mechanism the line up to five references is very unknown. And you can imagine that, you know, you know, not only impacts what we know about the biology or, you know, how the bacteria are infected, but impacts other things like diagnostic and vaccine, right? So, so it is, uh, leptus, again, one of the few bacteria in the world now, now, right now that actually can be killed and cured by penicillin. So if you give penicillin to more infected, the person just, you know, gets better, you know, have no infection. However, diagnostic acids are terrible. They're not very sensitive. Uh, they're not point of care, so they have to do like specialized labs. It takes a lot of time. You need some you need like convalescent samples. Uh, you know, convalescent samples you have to take like two or three weeks later. That time, either the patient already died or the patient survived. And of course, because it's a problem with disease, most of the symptoms are very common to all those diseases that we discuss here. You know, uh, so you go to the hospital with like fever, muscle pain, headaches. You know, you just like you can have a table of like all the acute febrile illness that you can have pick. In all of those diseases, a lot of those are viral, but a lot of those diseases have different kinds of like treatments and that would not be. So, so this diagnostic is very common. So that's a study that showed that, you know, 42% of the patients actually suck air during the first three days of illness, which is the worst one because that's only like very like unclear symptom. And like 62, 61% of those cases of lack of throws that eventually confirmed were diagnosed as saying, because again, you know, in Brazil, most of the people think like, oh, you, you know, you just have fever, muscle pain, most likely thing. So, you know, and then of course that, that increased ICU admission and increased the fatality rate because those people are not treated properly, eventually got, you know, uh, so it's a cost to the community, it's a cost to the society, and it's a cost also for the people. Who are misdiagnosed. So this is like an interesting cartoon. I don't know if you guys have seen it before, but it's basically like this is like a 996, that's a huge outbreak of lapto, but people are not you know about that, that much of the time. Uh, and then there's like a you know the basic the head is a GT and the rat is shaking here. So okay, I'll take two people to see you take the other people to see because that's what it happens, like a lot of cases are taking a lot of cases are so so, you know, so the, the lack of knowledge about mechanisms like pathogenesis not only affects what we understand about the disease, but affects like how to improve diagnostic and eventually how to improve uh, also vaccines. Uh, and I, I didn't mention it here, but then, you know, the other thing is, and again, I don't want to get into the situation, but I mean, there's vaccines for animals, but also like the lack of a good diagnostic you know, stops us to identify animals that could be vaccinated and actually animals that, you know, thoroughly sick. So it also gets a little bit more complicated. And, and you know, I know that you know it's curiosity, but again, tomorrow it's going to get about that. But again, this is not a common thing in Salvador. I mean, that study was in Salvador about this diagnosis, but this is like a you know a compilation of some studies that have been done, done throughout the world, either rural or urban or mixed. Uh, and you know, this is like pupa viral illness, and then eventually they decided to say, okay, you know, we're looking for malaria, we're looking for dengue, we're looking Whatever this is that word instead of elastic for life, but you can see here there's a huge number of those cases that uh all like sclerosis is going from like you know two percent to actually sixty percent of people who were thought to be on the paper that we were left to So a lot of those, you know, it's not a common thing in Brazil, it happens throughout the world that people misdiagnose like sclerosis as well. Um, so you know, so what are the studies that we've been doing to try to understand a little bit more about those things and how does that feel like one health and prevention eventually in diagnostic, which is always been the goal of my research. So, you know, one of the studies that we've done, uh, 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 you know, more focused on the pathogens that, you know, the interesting thing about Salvador, as I mentioned before, we have one strain that's circulating, right? And we have like hundreds and hundreds of isolated patients, but all those patients, they have like completely different outcomes. We got patients who have like, you know, just a mild fever, we have patients who have like, you know, some well disease or, you know, even like coronary artery syndrome, but survive. And then you have a lot of patients actually end up dying in the, in the first three or four days of very acute disease. So the question that we have, of course, is like, okay, this, uh, since all those cases isolated the same strain, 
Is this caused by a phone? Is there some modification of the string that's caused to be more driven? Or is something else, right? So the interesting thing is like we evaluated all those, we evaluated those token values for all parts of the world, temporal and geographical. And the funny thing is, or the interesting thing is that all those strings are completely very similar. There's like less than 200 snips of those things. None of those snips are associated with any outcome. So just prove that the bacteria that infected those patients is exactly the same bacteria. The same bacteria that's infecting Copenhagen, infecting people in El Salvador, is the same bacteria that infected people in China and Egypt. And that's the same people, same bacteria that infected people like almost like 100 years ago when they first identified the, the, the bacteria. So there's nothing to do with the, the bacteria that uh, uh, is caused those deep outcomes. So one clarification here, just for like, no confusion. I mentioned before there's 41 species. You know, among those species, a different species can have you know different levels of activity, right? So you can have one microspire of the eye causing something, you can have like another microspire of like slava or cardio that it might cause a completely different outcome of disease. What I'm trying so so genetically they can cause different outcomes. Okay, so there, there's some impact of the genome that causes pathogenesis, which we don't know yet, but there might be. What I'm trying to say is that the same stream that causes different outcomes, you know, those different outcomes are not caused by that. Okay, so we don't know, it could be. Again, it could be you know, patient, it could be genetics, uh, it could be valid you know, infection, could be those, could be other. So, you know, try to understand a little bit more. So, we've done studies, I mean, that was during my team here, I've done a study the, 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 the hamster mouse. And the interesting thing is that we saw is actually that the, the, the load of the lactophile in the tissue is not only a market for disease, but also a market for death. So, we use higher doses using uh, uh, IV infection. Uh, and then also lower doses of the same bacteria, you know, essentially 80 to 150. And the interesting thing that we see is that you can see here, you know, in the first, like, you know, when you did 10 to the 8 IP, in the first hour, you already see that the spiral is separated the whole body of the hamster. Okay, so you can see here, like, in the blood, in the kidney, in the eye, in the brain. You know, and then eventually, you know, you know Exponentially grows, and at some point here, around 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, after the you know the hamster dies, right? So what happened is 250 is that there's a delay in that, so you only start seeing like the dissemination at five days because it's been less active, but the trend is the same. Exponentially grow, get to the same level of the spires, and then the hamster dies. So you know, so that only indicates most likely that those of infection is something that is seen in all those outcomes. You have like a higher dose of infection, you're going to go to the hospital in the first three days. Very acute disease may not be able to save the patient because you die. If you have a lower dose of infection, there's more time to develop symptoms. You might see the doctor, you might be treated, you might survive. So, indicating that all of the we see, all of the different outcomes that you have in doses are more related to the different doses that you actually got when you infected. And again, we did some studies also in transcriptional analysis. In patients that actually uh, die and survive all the first, comparing, comparing them to the healthy you know, uh, individuals. And we saw that, like, you know, individuals that actually die, they have a huge decrease in activation and migration in new cells like REMS, T3I, uh, They have a diminished T cell and antibody responses, and they have like poor antibacterial side effect by the response uh, in those cases compared to patients that actually got severe disease and survived. And if you look like a, a, a the, the genes are down regulated. So it literally is associated with uncontrolled leptospermia. And actually, those patients have like this sort of like storm life side of time. So it's like, you know, everything is like, you know, uh, uh, you know upregulated and individual uh, potentially uh, uh, die. So, um, and the interesting thing about what I mentioned before about the, the, the catalyst side, which is the, the uh, antibacterial side of uh, peptide. Is that we use that in the hamster model, and eventually we saw that when you add, you know, a uh, uh, catalyzer in those animals after infection, you can actually reduce the death of the animal and also reduce the number of leptospires in the in the blood. So we really have an effect in the uh, in the uh, how the body can control uh, leptospirosis, and we've been exploring that, trying to see if we can, you know, use that as a treatment. Or not. And then more recently, what we saw. You know, doing studies uh, uh, in, in terms of like the barium and the skin. So we developed like a, a, a different uh, a method for uh, for actually challenging the animals. You know, leptospirosis. I mentioned before that the low fat bacteria 
can actually penetrate uh, tissues. And actually, the studies show here, you know, you know, if you put like leptospire in the fur of the hamster, you know, in high doses, 12 days later, that hamster died. In fact, that really can penetrate like, you know, uh, impact skin. But the interesting thing is that if you do like a scarify skin just a little bit, actually the, the number of like the dose that you need is almost close to IP, which is completely non-realistic when you put that device inside the peritoneum of the hamster. But you know, just a scarification of the skin and you can lap through, and then just leave it for five minutes and actually animals can die. So just showing that uh, um, really the, 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 the skin is a crucial barrier to that those infection. And actually explains a lot because you know studies that I'm going to mention about that just found like very low doses of electrophoresis in the environment. We never understood how those low doses can actually infect the disease, but that would make sense. Like you know, those people living in those communities, they usually have everybody has like some sort of like you know, cuts in your skin and things, so facilitates really uh, infection even when you have low doses in the environment. Um, and then you know, so you know, we we got those studies that I mentioned. Most of those studies actually were conducted by you know. Former postdocs that we have in the lab are now Casanovas. And then we show, as I mentioned before, that as far as very beaches in the urban slum environment. So, whatever you actually got soil or water, you're going to have at the fire, no matter what's high or low, we found at the fire everywhere. Um, but an interesting thing is that the environment is not a multiplication reservoir, but it's basically a temporary carrier of lepra. So, lepra cannot swim, they cannot thrive in the environment. And we did a you know, study. Uh, in the future, but also environment, but it's like you really cannot try in, 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 uh, 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 in the environment, but it can survive enough that, you know, when you have, you know, rain or something uh, effects, actually bring them back and can cause effects. And again, as I mentioned before, low environmental concentrations may still enable the transmission of the disease because they're still alive. And then, uh, uh, you know, the more recent study that we've done is just show that uh, really shows this uh, 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 immunological quality population that's persistent over time and connects the environment to the rat to the human. So what we show is like no matter the time that we did temporarily, we have isolates from both the environment from the rats and the humans, and those strains are exactly the same. So basically showing that the same strain that is in the rat is the strain that is in the environment is the strain that's causing the same thing. So just like showing this. Epidemiological cycle was one of the first studies that actually showed that really evidence of, I mean, everybody knew about that, but there's no evidence of that cycle itself. Uh, so, you know, of course, that we should be thinking about that, we should focus on interventions uh, to reduce human exposures to environmental sources, which is kind of like no brainer when you think about those kind of diseases, but another that very easy thing to do when you're dealing with like uh, some years. And then, you know, there's an interesting study that actually uh, Dr. Jenna also made. With me a little while in Yale, and she got some samples from those, uh, uh, you know, in the uh, this uh, wildlife center environment authorities that they have those the capture monkey. In the past, there's a, there's a study showing uh, an outbreak of leptospirosis in those uh, monkeys, the foreign capture monkeys. Uh, and what she did, actually, brought like samples from the monkeys, samples from the environment where those monkeys live. You can see here there's a lot of like, of course, feces and food. Uh, you know, so there's like a prevalence of rats in those areas as, you know, sources of water. So she got also rats for those. And the interesting thing, like when she did PCR and MAT, I mean, 50, almost 60%, 44% of the, the monkeys were positive for electrophoresis. And, you know, and in the PCR, 75% of those rats are positive, 50% of the pathology monkeys were positive in the, in the urine. And then you have 40% of those water that were like available in that area were also uh, uh, positive. So this again showing the cycle of epidemiology of lepto, the transition between rat environment and host in this case monkeys. The interesting thing is that we developed this like new PCR that, that can differentiate between P1 and P2. And actually she found, especially in the rat samples, that actually you can have both P1 and P2 also circulating, although most of the monkeys actually only have uh, P1, but the, the P2s are also circulating in the environment, but circulated in the, in the reservoir as well. Uh, and then, you know, just to finish a little bit, so we did a study uh, recently uh, in Brazil uh, to show, uh, you know, again, trying to uh, improve the situation of people, you know, you know, as I'm sure the situation is similar in, in, in Colombia as it is in Brazil. I mean, this population, we've been working for them as I mentioned before for 20 years, there are plans, there are huge investments to try to, to close the sewers in those communities. Uh, 
uh, um, you know, actually I teach a class at Yale, it's called like, uh, what is intuitive global health? And it's very hard for me out to have to explain to people why we need evidence that my clothes is smooth, but smooth not for people. But unfortunately, in terms of like, when it comes to the future, the term money that we're gonna invest in, uh, in, in policy, especially in developing countries, you know, a lot of the excuses that those people use at all, there's not evidence. I mean, all this stuff, which is true, a lot of the studies that use uh, uh, clinical trials, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, because there's a lot of issues there, but uh, uh, studies, but they, they don't show high evidence, uh, but there are good ones that show. But anyway, so what you know, what happened is that the community got tired of waiting for those because as any other Latin American country, there's a lot of corruption, a lot of the money that was invested was not used for what it's supposed to be used. Uh, so a lot of those people didn't get to it a little bit. So the community decided to start, you know, doing that. So you can see here, this is like a, so this is like, you know, open sewer. This is like where the government actually flows, you know, uh, efficiently the, the sewer. And this is what the community tried to do, like just put some boards and to prevent any health the situation. So what I decided to do is to see if there's any difference between the number of electrospires in the environment when you do those situations compared to the open sewer. So we can explore a large area. We have like a lot of, uh, 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 Collection of soil, like five, you know, uh, grams of soil, like subsoils, so we just dig in, uh, uh, get the soil, and we did a lot of the air and we decided to aid in the rat uh, activity. And just like a, this is interesting, but it's a study that was done, and they, they do this like it's called like black pump, and they like suits that you, you put in those polyvinyl plates and put in the areas, and then at night the the rats walk. You know, you can see the the, the, the tail marks and the the paws. And then they, they develop a system that it can count how many you know, the bad activity in the area. So you know about the more bad activity here, not there, and it worked very well. Unless when the community decides to play with the, you know, just get in the morning there, and then like something that has like, 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 you know, just say like a rat was here or anything. But it works pretty well, and that's how they use it for this study. But the interesting thing is that it showed that the convention of the government closing were three times less likely to contain pathogenic leptospirus uh, uh, in the environment around that, uh, and also six times lower uh, load of pathogenic leptospirus. And you know, the human fecal markers were related to leptospirus. So if you have human fecal markers, you would have leptospirus in the environment as well. And but the interesting thing is like rat present was not predicted the pathogenic presence uh, whatsoever. So it doesn't matter if the rat was there or not, you still see lacto, and again, just just showing that this epidemiological cycle of lepto is way more complex than just like having the rat and just killing the rat. And to show also like more evidence that all those, you know, uh, uh, chemical treatment that people try to do with rats, not only affected because of the nature of the rat, because they usually you know, come back in waste, but also just killing the rats is not solely the issue of uh, the girls in that environment. Um, so, you know, but that's what's, uh, 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 and of course that, you know, it's sad to, to, to say that the community closing is not you know, good enough. So now, you know, the, the, the group there is trying to, you know, uh, uh, you know, continue their studies and actually try to see if eventually those closing the sewer in the conventional community led to, you know, reduce of infection in humans itself. Right? This is just reduction of the pathogen in the environment, but that would lead to reduction of infection uh, as well. Uh, and then, you know, we've done some studies also in, in Codium Array, and it's just an introduction because I'm going to talk a little bit more about Codium Array tomorrow, but, you know, uh, trying to see natural acquired immunity against lacto and just using those systems where you put like a Codium lacto, use syrup people have infected, and try to understand uh, what are the proteins that are really leading that uh, infection itself. And we were able to identify several candidates uh, that are being explored in terms of vaccine and diagnostic uh, as well. And then more recently, uh, you know, uh, actually this is a work that is being done, you know, as we speak at Yale for my postdoc. So, you know, a lot of the studies that we have to do animal experiments, you know, it's expensive, it takes time. So we're trying to understand if there's any like new pieces of media that we can use that could mimic what happened in the, in the uh, uh, in animal and humans. So we actually show that, uh, you know, there's a huge different uh, uh, expression of genes uh, when you use different medias for growing up to sclerosis, and also like a, this is like a whole blood it actually animal that had been infected. Uh, but we saw, especially when you change the temperature and you add the CO2, but we saw that it's the simple main media that is used for like whole cells, like EMM, EMM, which is probably all of you guys use. Just that at 37 degrees, 5% CO2, growing up to spire, the left of the, the, the the way the electrospire behaves is actually very similar to the way that it behaves in the West, you know, in, the, in the whole blood. 
And actually, you can see that shares a lot of the genes, you know, those EMA and EMA mammals, which are uh, uh, whole blood, you know, compared to EMGA, which is the original media for that, which grows at 30, 30 degrees. Uh, and also, this new media, which is developed by, you know, by USDA, who also used to the 7 degrees and, and five percent CO2, but it's very similar to uh, EMGA. And actually, the, the protein array actually shows the same. But that discover that media can uh, allow us to uh, uh, apply for this funding. And what we're doing right now is just trying to understand what are the, the differentially uh, expressed genes during the transitions of that, you know, the immunological cycle method that I told you about. So basically, we're using EMAM, which is like the host life. So it's like we predict, so imagine this is like a rat. So then let the spider go to the environment, which is water. And then we measure like differentially expression genes in one hour, 16 hours. And then from here, we pass to again to EMM, which is again a you know, post, and then we can measure expression uh, of the genes. We can validate those, and it actually works very well. And we're just getting results about those two three companies. The idea is trying to understand what are the genes that are uh, 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 important that, that those transitions, but also you work in collaboration with evolution and you know, with different species and trying to understand also like the evolution of genetic. You know, uh, the genes that are specialized, eventually going to specialize uh, for pathogenesis. Uh, and, and again, I just, you know, this is the last slide I promise. And I just want to, you know, for you guys to keep those concepts in terms of like, you know, let us find the environment with the immediate zoonotic disease, you know, uh, reservoirs and maintain amplified conditions, kill away infected humans, and the pathogen determines that humans is usually natural disease. disease. Change epidemiology and disease emergency to, to globalization climate, just keep that in mind. And it is a neglected disease affecting neglected populations uh, um, and a social justice and effective uh, uh, intervention. And as I mentioned before, we have to be creative, we have to be multidisciplinary. And you know, the best thing to do to act is like you know, thinking more about this one health uh, idea. A, a lot of people involved in this, a lot of funding. Uh, this is actually, which I just noticed that. Janet was in there by but she's not in the picture, but she's kind of like a good team. But uh, so this is our, you know, my group at the time, and these are, uh, and um, uh, that's it. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for an amazing presentation. I'm a student of the major with a scientist. Uh, uh, actually, all this is not particularly my student choice, but this is giving me a lot of perspective. And uh, my question is considering that that slide you showed where you mentioned that all infectious processing processes in humans are caused by the same strain, right? Uh, do you think difference, differences in outcomes could be more related to cost specific factors or? Well, if so, what possible factors you suggest could play a role in those differences in that times? Okay, so that's it's an interesting question. I would, and I don't know. I mean, that would be uh, that would be just you know my assumption. So most of the cases of that, as I mentioned before, in the urban slums in Brazil, and those, those are the studies that we've done, and those are the patients that we've done. I mean, most of those, although as you know, it's, it's hard to actually know exactly how the infection happens, but we do, we do know that the, the most important reservoir is the rat you know, or, the, uh, or the environment itself. So, so the chances that those could be related to different hosts are, are very small. In other parts of the world, they didn't have other bacteria, other species being infected in humans in, in, in different reservoirs, right? So we have like, you know, some kind of mouse that is the main reservoir for infection, some kind of have cattle that is the main reservoir for infection. Sometimes you have a white animal there. Uh, uh, so those can potentially have an effect in terms of the outcome itself. And, and the strain itself can have an effect. But in this case, for Salvador specifically, and again, because we're privileged in terms of research that we have once we articulate, we know that those outcomes most likely are not related to the whole. So as I mentioned before, it could be because of the dose. That's my hypothesis. That's what I've been trying to prove either right or wrong. But I mean, but of course, there's also effects to the host, right? So there's genetic effects. I mean, we know that, for example, like males are more susceptible to the disease. Although, when it comes to severe disease, there's no actually evidence that males are more susceptible or not. Males are more susceptible to 
for infection, but not necessarily for uh, for severe disease. I mean, there's some studies that actually show that women were more susceptible to severe disease, but uh, there's not exactly very good data of that. Uh, so, so there, there might potentially, you know, of course, some genetic infection that causes itself, uh, which I wouldn't, you know, start that. But, but I really believe that that's uh, 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 much to do with those that are infected with those people. Are dead. This is an oversight for like the that World Health Organization not include it so clear for some reason. That's a very good question. So, you know, it depends on this, the website that you go to look. So, if you go to the CDC website, the CDC has like a, like a secondary list of neglected doctor diseases that you like what is out there. Uh, that way, Joe, you can dig a little bit more and you can find right through there some points saying that it's important. But, you know, I don't know. I have, my, I have my personal passion to say that I think it's a, you know, it's a disease that is not fancy, it's not, you know, it's not shiny, and, uh, and affects mostly poor people. It's not a problem for the United States. So far, that's what I've been trying to do. And not, but I'm a bit away, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know why. I mean, there, there is a push. I mean, we're talking. Um, I was talking about earlier today. I mean, Sudpaster has <clears throat> the Sudpaster has separated from basically from the, the Pasteur network, which you know manages all the sites of Pasteur throughout the world, which they have like Asia, South America, um, and uh, and the new director of that side, she's very interested in that approach. She's very interested in diagnostic because you no, know, because they do work in those countries where uh, that is a problem. So she's very interested. And she's also pushing, you know, people in that region that are, you know, uh, thinking that now is the time, you know, after the whole pandemic with COVID, and now might be the time to actually push for for better vaccine for that. So just for us, it's pretty Sense 
to the physics. So that's what we do today. We just literally open the eye, drop left in the eye, and that's how you know, the guy affected. So, so, uh, uh, so I don't know, you know, the, 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 the late trial, the trial tell us condition about that. I mean, a lot of people, the risk for, for being infected with left in that case was actually people swallowing water. So again, I don't think it's swallowing the thing, but I think it's the mouth. So for the for the monkeys related to the, to the rats, it's hard to tell because it could be, I mean, those monkeys are, you know, they are eating the food, which is true, they might have urine, but they also at the same time, they also have scratches, they also dealing with like puddles of water there in the air, they also dealing uh, uh, with the you know uh, with the contaminated environment that's there. So it's hard to tell exactly what is a malady infection and maybe not necessarily oral, but it could be other sources of uh, I know this is very related with uh you know who said that the knowledge of in the US or also there is for example with you know, the UIP arena in the park in New Zealand, there were no cases of that. Or was it so, so let me tell you this. So, when I say that, I say that as a, as a you know, I'm being sarcastic because no, the truth is there is. And I actually deleted it because I think it was too much for showing you guys here. But, you know, to be effective in my presentation, I, I show like several publications showing like you know, cases of life in the United States. And it has like outbreaks in Florida. Know, Hawaii, they literally, if anybody goes to Hawaii, you can look for this place, they have like signs that says, like, you know, uh, you know, swim at your own risk, leptospirosis infection, because there's a lot of leptospirosis in Hawaii. Uh, so, you know, there was, I mean, we did several studies in uh, New Orleans in uh, rats, and there's, you know, there's a lot of leptospirosis in the rats in New Orleans. Uh, so, so it, you know, it, it, but it is a disease that's affected to poverty, right? So, these are the old rural areas. Uh, you know, so I mean, there might be a lot of cases that you know we don't know about uh, uh, being infected because a lot of the cases are like trained strain can be asymptomatic or self-resolving. Um, but there are several cases of uh, outbreaks in the United States. And also, you know, uh, in animal you know, too, I mean, there's a lot of cases of like uh, cattle, in the cattle, but a lot of cases of also in the dogs. Also, a lot of like outbreaks of those dogs throughout the section of the United States every single year. Uh, so it's not that the disease is not there, but, but because you know the way that the cities are established, you know, established, you know, you don't see a lot of those uh, you know, becoming like huge major issues that we see in those neighborhoods. I know that you mentioned the association between uh, leptospirosis and rural areas. Uh, I'm curious about the uh, epidemiological situation or epidemiological panorama of lepto in the Midwest, Nebraska, Iowa. And well, so so a lot of those are related to animals because you know Midwest United States, for example, like in Wisconsin, you know, there's a lot of like dairy cows, so there's a lot of lepto. But I mean, the, the thing is that there are vaccines for animals, right? So. Uh, uh, you know, again, I didn't show here, but for example, like the dogs, they do like thousands and thousands of like you know, PCRs over the years, and the average of positivity is like from 10 to 50 percent throughout the United States. And Midwest is very dark, you know, there's a lot of like those circulating there, those animals. but it is a disease that has a vaccine. You know, it's not very effective, it's not a good vaccine, but there is a vaccine, and it's recommended, it's not mandatory, but it's recommended. And when you deal with like dairy counts, you do like beef counts, or livestock in general. Most of the time, especially in developed countries, they do vaccinate uh, leptospirosis as well, and then come together with other diseases. Okay. So, um, so it protects more uh, 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 in that sense. So, you know, when it comes to wild wild animals, I don't think we have any idea. In a lot of part of the world, definitely not in the United States. Uh, so, so I, I I didn't I didn't make a point now, but I already I, I have. I always doubt about it, I should say that now, but I have like a you know, safe, so like, you know, rural leptospirosis might be very difficult to control. And, and it might be true, because how can you control wild animals? Like how can you control those things? So, I mean, we can talk about that when I talk about vaccines. There's a possibility that, you know, again, one health impact of like vaccinating, even like the massive animals and humans potentially that will be potentially created like a, you know, a protection for those people and you don't have infection. It doesn't matter whether you have the wild. Um, but yeah, United States definitely don't know anything about wild animals. 